Coming up on This Week in Google, we've got Kevin Marks, Ron Richards, and myself, Jason Howell. We're going to talk all about some pixel rumors that are around the corner, a little bit about the essential phone. We've got Boston Dynamics robots. They're making a move to SoftBank. Uh, we've got Facebook and Safety Check. A whole lot to talk about coming up next on This Week in Google. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Google is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twig, This Week in Google, episode 409 for Wednesday, June 14th, 2017. Practical Telepathy. This episode of This Week in Google is brought to you by Captera. Captera helps you find and compare software solutions for your business needs with over 400 software categories, from accounting to workflow management. Visit captera.com slash twig to start your free search today. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twig. It's time for Twig this week in Google. Week two, I think, of two of Leo Laporte being out of the studio. So I'm in his place. Jason Howell, I'm super psyched to be back. I have not one, but two amazing guests because both Jeff and Stacy are actually out this week. We had to get two amazing guests to fill their shoes. First up, uh, my longtime friend, Ron Richards, all about Android and so many other things, including a Twin Peaks podcast, by the way. Yes, my many, many podcasts. It's great to be back. <laughs> I believe uh, last time I was on This Week in Google, it was the same lineup, I think. I know. Yes, it was very yeah, close to this. Yes. I think it was right around pixel time or hardware yes. time. Uh, also joining us, Kevin Marks, kevinmarks.com. How's it going, Kevin? Uh, it's going great. It's not. It's just turning to sunset here in the UK, so I know. ready for an, an interesting chat about what's happened this week. I, I got to <laughs> gotta get used to this whole Kevin not coming to us from outside in the sunlight like it's it's taking me a while to process this kevin if we did a morning show it could be in the sunlight but it's, it's <laughs> i'll tell you what it's, i'm not doing a morning show it's, it's too dusk. early <laughs> i'm not down with that uh it's great to have you both here uh i actually missed last night's all about android so thankfully i'll get a chance to kind of talk about some of the the android Google news uh, that you yeah. guys talked about last night. There's a, there's a bunch of interesting stuff, and we missed you a lot. Uh, and you can go to twit.tv slash AA to see us missing you real time. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I believe at the top of the show, I was ple I was going, oh, Jason, why aren't you here? Uh, but, uh, yeah, but I'm glad that we got we get our time in now with uh, this week in Google. We can talk about Android. So. That's right. <laughs> why, why don't we kick it off with something that I feel like is, is pretty familiar, uh, sure. familiar space for, for all of us. And I can't remember. Kevin, do you have a Pixel phone? Are you Pixel right now? I have a Pixel phone, yes. Okay, so we're all so uh, Kevin and I are, are are the Pixel. Ron, you're still hanging out with the with the Robin. I'm still hanging out with the Robin, although I have come to the conclusion that the moment that the essential phone in that green color and that green and gold combination goes, I'm going to put my money down. I'm going to do it. So do it. Uh, I'm I'm getting ready to move on from the next bit Robin. Which, by the way. I feel like it's not on the dock. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned this earlier. Nope. Did you see that Amazon is selling the Nextbit Robin for $117 now? I didn't see that. $117. So, if, so would you recommend it for $117? I mean, absolutely. it's your jam. This is, it's a complete no-brainer. If you're looking for a phone, a low-cost Android phone for anyone in your family or just to get or a test device or anything like that, at $117 from Amazon, that, like you cannot beat that price. It's amazing. So uh, I don't know why it's doing it. I don't know if it's a glitch. I don't know if it's a problem. But literally right now on Amazon, it's a, uh, both colors, both Midnight and Mint. I don't know if they're just getting rid of dead stock as Razer is kind of you know winding down the Robin for whatever's going to come next from Nextbit. But uh, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a super cheap. Good deal. Search for it on Amazon, $117. Yeah, that would be my guess. They're probably trying to blow it out a little bit. Because, I mean, are they coming out with another another Robin now that Razer owns it? Or is it going in a completely different direction? We don't know. Everything that I've, I mean, everything that I've heard, and I haven't heard much, to be honest. Right, there but, hasn't um, been much. Was that was that, yeah, that Razor acquired Nextbit. They were keeping it as an independent entity um, and that they were going to be, Razor was going to, you know, get stuff from Nextbit. Nextbit would have the support to continue on. So my guess is that there's got to be another 
device in the works that they're gonna unveil and that will be like the next one, you know, the, the next phone. But um, they stopped selling the next bit Robin on their website. They stopped selling anything on their website. And all I've seen is the Robin being on sale at various places. So, you know, I'm curious to see what the plan is. But as far as I know, next bit is still an entity. Okay. So yeah. then, so then um, Kevin, you, you had said that you were a little bit out of, out of, out of tune with like the now news. Did you catch the essential news from, I think it was a, at this point a week or two ago, Randy Rubin's kind of follow up? Yes. Yes. I did see that. Yeah. That, but that's kind of interesting. Did it peak? I um, mean, is, is it something that you, that you would consider kind of moving away from the, the pixel for? I, I think this is the question that a lot of like Android fans are asking themselves. Do you stick with the Google or do you go with the father of Google? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I had a sidekick, so I've had Andrew Rubin design phones for oh, what's that? Twelve years now, no more. Yeah, yeah, was, forty yeah, years was now. About that time, yeah, <laughs> two thousand three. So, um, I, I'm not completely convinced yet. I'm, I'm intrigued by it, um, and I'm, I'm also intrigued by the, um, the the rumors about the operating system for the home and those pieces. But that's all rumors. It's footstep vapor at the moment. Right. So it's it's one of those wait and see things. Yes. It's, I, I, I do tend to buy the latest Google phone and keep that. I, I don't, uh, and I don't change it that often. Maybe maybe once once every eighteen months or so. So right. when I when I moved to the UK, I got this one. Before that, I had the um, the original um, Nexus uh, Six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's a pretty nice looking phone. There was this news that I know you guys talked about last night, and all about Android. Yep. That um, I mean, initially when we heard about the essential phone. It was Andy Rubin just basically saying, we're going unlocked. We're selling it through our own channels. We're not going to be in any carrier stores. And now suddenly, Essential has an exclusivity deal with Sprint that basically means that you're going to be able to go into a Sprint store and find uh, the Essential phone. Uh, it'll still work on all U.S. carriers, so it's not like this phone only works on Sprint. It's just Sprint, as far as we know, as of this point, is the only carrier store here in the U.S. where you could actually go in and see it being uh, displayed on the shelves and have the representatives point you in that direction. Um, and it, the essential president, Nicolo De Masi, told USA Today, this is how the news broke, uh, we like to bet where we think the market is going as opposed to where the market was. He says, I feel like we are a new brand and a new consumer electronics company, and we are partnering with the network of the future. Is Sprint the network of the future? Well, that that was that, we we talked about this last night on all about Android. But Jason, I'm actually I want to turn it around on you as the host. What do you think of this announcement and this news? Because I have thoughts and opinions, but I don't want to bias you with my thoughts. So I want to hear when you when you heard this, what was your immediate kind of response? Oh well, I mean, I think my knee jerk response was Sprint, really. But that was my knee jerk response. But I came right. around. I came around. Honestly, I think any deal is good when you're talking about getting into carrier stores. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very U.S. centric conversation, right? Because the essential, you know, has, I'm sure Andy Rubin has plans for this to be all over the, all over the world. Um, but in the U.S., I mean, in some ways you live and die by your availability in carrier stores for right or wrong. And people outside of the U.S. to, to a certain degree have a hard time sometimes understanding that, but that's just the way it is here. People will buy from their carrier, whether it's a good or a bad idea, it's there, it's being presented to them, it's being sold to them from a representative. So that can actually really influence the the sales numbers on your device. So I think when you're Andy Rubin, you know, trying to guide your new brand to some sort of success, having a deal is better than not having a deal. And it, like expecting the general consumer to go online and to buy it unlocked and to be able to have that be your strategy for success over the next however many years, I don't think that happens. I think at some point you have to figure out your way into a carrier store. If they can get into Sprint and they can prove that it has some sort of momentum, they get Sprint's kind of money, you know, marketing muscle behind it. Sprint's going to be pretty happy to have, you know, the father of Android's newest phone. So they're probably going to at least make some sort of a big deal about it. That could be really good for the essential brand. So and, where, where I, I mean, that is, I that is one big, after you, Kevin, sorry. I mean, that is one big difference moving back to the UK is that um, here you can buy Sims in any shop. I mean, literally any right. shop, like shop you buy your newspapers and sweets from that have a little rack of Sims up there for a pound each and you buy them and then you can you can top them up there as well. Mm -hmm. So pay as you go Sims are here. We, yeah, we have phones, you know, we have phone stores too. We have more carriers 
and there's much more interrupt. Is there's much there's much less locked phones and so on. You can do the the full full contract thing, but you can just by default you tend to get unlocked phones and the ability to swap SIMs in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the the interesting thing about this though is that like my first gut reaction was like oh Sprint ooh you know and I actually and I, I recounted Poor this Sprint. on 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 all about Android last night as well too that I talked to two individual different people and they both had the same opinion which is like oh Essential's gonna be on Sprint too bad nope you know and just an immediate shutdown at the at the S word as they said it at, at Sprint being involved but then the news broke yesterday um, and I, I dropped it into the chat in the doc if you want to show it uh, Sprint's offering uh, a free year of unlimited service if you if you switch to their service I didn't so, see that so yeah, so I think that this is really interesting, and that's I think Sprint's trying to breathe life into their brand. They're doing whatever they can, and they're like this offer of a free year is a very T-Mobile esque promotion. Yeah, right. Doesn't absolutely. doesn't that seem very T-Mobile? Like seems out like of T-Mobile's playbook, right? And absolutely. um, and I think that my guess is that they must have you know they must have dumped a bunch of money in in Essentials uh pocket in order to get this exclusive, um. I think that Essential has to get into the carriers. I mean, we've talked about this uh, all, every time I talk about cell phones. The great OnePlus is a great phone. Grab somebody on the street; they don't know how to get it. No, you know, like no. we all know that you can go, you can buy these phones unlocked. It's not Kevin. It's not like in the UK with Carphone Warehouse and places like that, where you, where you know, there's a different, there's a different approach to phones in other countries. Here, the millions and millions of people go to the cell phone store. And it's it, it could yeah. be Verizon, it could be Sprint, it could be T-Mobile, it's whatever's in their neighborhood, and they buy whatever phone is there. So if Essential wants to break away from the OnePluses and the Next Bits and all the other these other kind of you know even Huawei, like all these kind of you know one-off um, hardware startups that are trying to break into the U.S. market, they have to get with a carrier. So if it's with Sprint, so be it. Maybe maybe the sales are enough then that when the exclusive ends, then T-Mobile and AT&T want on board. No. Yeah, and if if. Uh yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. Sprint Sprint needs eyeballs. It needs it needs some sort of fire um, underneath their brand because they're clearly behind the other three at this point. The, yep. This is totally out of T-Mobile's playbook, and T-Mobile continues to do these things. And T-Mobile, you know, is is improving its network, so it's 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 able to kind of back it up at this point. Um, I think this was just this was an opportunity for Sprint to say, hey, here's what has the potential to be a very kind of eye-catching, very um, I don't know, buzzworthy device, and it doesn't yep. have a carrier agreement. We're willing to to do what needs to happen in order to give you know, bring them into our stores to make it comfortable for them. We're there early on and, you know, maybe that ends up, you know, giving a little bit of extra cachet to Sprint. I just don't know how much, how much power the essential brand will have out of the gate. And I don't think it has very much out of the gate. It has to build that. This is a way to start but building. It's, it's got to start somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, and, and with that Sprint offer, there are tons of uh, restrictions and like not all phones and all this sort of stuff, but still, even then some people are going to get free service. And so I think it's really interesting and, and hopefully, People give Essential a try through Sprint, and uh, like I'm rooting for Essential just because I'm rooting for innovation in the space. And you're you yep. have said that you plan on getting an Essential. Is that I, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm waiting. I'm waiting desperately for uh, for some uh, date around the. I think it's the was the ocean blue color. What is it? Is that what it is? Like uh, we're not ocean blue or ocean green. I, I forget what the color is. <laughs> but uh, let's see. I'm, I'm going on the website. But not right your now. standard black white. I don't uh, want the black aluminum. or white. No, that's on the thing now. Yeah, it's ocean depths. That's what it's called now. Ocean depths. It's, okay. it's, it's it's the the green phone with the with the gold kind of uh, bezel or you know kind of frame around it. Um, yeah, like a black or white. That's boring. After go after with the next bit, Robin having such a unique looking phone. Right. I want to make sure I have <laughs> unique looking phones. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's just hope that it has that the essential has a little bit more longevity on the on the design, like on the on the actual durability of the design uh, than the yeah. next bit, Robin. Because your, I, your yeah. phone's showing a little bit of age. I'm not gonna oh, lie. I've, I've definitely uh, I've definitely beaten that phone up uh, quite a bit. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but yeah that, I'll, I want to put the Essentials titanium case uh, uh, to uh, kind of give it the the drop challenge myself. So <laughs> Ooh, titanium's nice and all, but there's also a little bit of ceramic in there, so just be careful. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to the phone, and I think it's an eye catching device. And um, yeah, any any deal is better than no deal. I also really hope that Sprint doesn't get in there and you know one one of the things that Andy Rubin was really kind of 
very emphatic about was a very kind of cruft free true android experience no extra kind of you know bloat bloat apps on there and once you start making deals with carriers at least in the android space not in the ios space I, apple's made the deals to where they this doesn't happen it seems like but on android it ends up meaning that you get a bunch of extra apps and icons that maybe you do or do not want there uh so hopefully that doesn't happen with this but i guess we'll see um, so uh, what I was originally going to talk about, but I'm happy we started with uh, the essential first is kind of this, we've suddenly had this influx of pixel news, which I'm a, I'm a pixel XL owner. Uh, Kevin, you've got the pixel. Do you have the, the bigger one or the, the smaller one? Oh, oh, the big one. Yeah. Yeah. The XL. You, you've got the XL. Oh, wow. So, so the rumors had been up until now, we've been hearing little bits here and there that there were going to be not one, not two, but three pixel phones. It was going to be the the next generations of the ones we have and then a much larger one or something. I, I got confused. It's all rumory. It doesn't really matter, I suppose, when it's in the rumor world. Um, but apparently, <clears throat> excuse me, Android Police is pretty darn confident that the successor to the Pixel XL is actually not happening. Uh, the code name Musky. I love their code names for these phones. <laughs> the fish. Uh, it's a fish, right? All around fish. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um in its place, they're going to opt for the even larger Pixel than the XL, so maybe the double XL or whatever they're going to end up calling it. So, and I, I don't, I don't understand. I, I don't get it. So the Pixel XL right now, the 2016, which is what I have, is 5.5 uh, inches. So I, I would think that that would be a good kind of, you know. See, that's a decent size to go with the sequel. From what I understand from this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ron, is that they're not going to be replacing this size with a sequel. They're going to be replacing this size with a with a larger one. Is that right? That's that, that's the rumor. Yeah, that that, that it's going to be a larger uh, version of it. It's going to be a next gen. Um, and there's also a bunch of other rumors about the chipsets as well. Is that the, did you see that yeah. hiring announcement? Yeah. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, lot, lots of pixel rumors. We're in the, we're in the pre pixel announcement rumor mode, right? <laughs> we are. Yeah. It, yeah. We've done this. We've done this enough, you know, a number of years now to the point to where we know the, the phases that we've gone into. Yep. And now that we're in summertime, <laughs> it's like leading up to Google hardware time for the next couple of months. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of, 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 uh, things leaking, around this one of them is that the successor will be larger but that it'll be a narrower um screen ratio so similar to what we see with the samsung galaxy s8 s8 yep. plus it's a larger screen but you know it's it's taller essentially and narrower uh less bezel of course because everybody's going less bezel and that was what, a main what? that was a big complaint that people had about the pixel uh is that it was a it was a it loved its bezels at least at the top and bottom, and and what what do I always say, Jason? The the, the future is bezelless. Yes, so, I, I yeah. don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> bezel never bothered me. I don't know, Kevin. You've lived with this device. Did the did the top and bottom bottom bezels ever ever stick out to you sorely? Um, well, I, pref I preferred it when I had one that was black around the edges rather than white. But this was the one that they had in stock, so I've got the one that's white. But <laughs> um, you know, there's 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 dead space there. Yeah, there's dead so space. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, no, I, could, I could, I could use, you know, use a bit less space and and, and be more useful. But you have still got the challenge of what you do with, with to do where you put the cameras when you when you shrink the bezel. So exactly. Yeah. Well, and I mean, if you take a look at what <laughs> what Essential did, they just notched out the display. They were like, yeah, well, the the camera's going to go there. We'll <laughs> just put the display around it in a little U shape. <laughs> I think it looks a little right. weird. Ron, you, you I love see. it. I love it. I think it's great. The weirder the better. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's gonna that's gonna <laughs> work for that. What's up, Kevin? As long as you're like something you're trying to read isn't under it. You know, that's the Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the questions that I have, right? It's it's right up there in the notification pane. It, is that gonna require some sort of custom like work you know what I mean? Like you can't you can't yeah. have your notifications uh hidden because the notch is taken out and the OS doesn't recognize that. I'm sure they'll have that figured out, but Yeah. I, I gotta imagine they're smart enough to figure that out for whatever reason, but yeah. Yeah. Um, no. But I, I, I happen to. I mean, like, so if the essential phone hadn't come out, I was eyeing the Pixel as my next phone, um, and I was in that mode of, am I gonna wait for the Pixel two or not, and and maybe wait till the Pixel two gets announced and get the Pixel at a cheaper price, yeah. like that sort of thing. But um, I, I gotta admit, from the the few times I've seen the new Samsung Galaxy phone, I like the longer, thinner style one. I think the I think the fat big version 
is like I I I, I don't know. It's something about the long Samsung phone that I think that's a good uh, aspect ratio for phones moving forward. And yes, it's hard to get your thumb all the way down to the top, but so you two hand it. You know, like it's not the end of the world. Um, but then usually I fall for the you know the five and a half inch kind of size, the smaller size phone anyway. So I doubt right. I'd even buy either of them. So it doesn't really matter. But yeah, I do I do I do like the longer version. I would agree. I would agree. Actually, I would. I would not be. And and we saw that from the six. Like I had the the six before the six P, which was fatter than this one. And I mean, you couldn't even you couldn't even reach across to the other side of the screen with one hand. It was definitely a, a two handed thing. <laughs> I've, I've definitely yeah. noticed the slimmer they're getting, even though they're they're increasing the screen size. They're able to kind of maximize the size of the device around the display, make it a little slimmer so it's easier to use with one hand. Uh, but still have kind of the overall size and, and dimension of the phone um, one handable. You know what I mean? Uh, it's bigger, but it's not because they're reducing right. the bezels. So, um, so there's that trend that is apparently potentially going to come to this rumored Pixel uh, sequel. Uh, four gigs of RAM, octa core CPU, uh, which Snapdragon 835 is is what's expected there. Um, and I mean. Other things. Let's see here. What was the next one? LG is uh, is apparently potentially going to be working on this device. We with the previous with the Pixel that we have now, it was made by Google. But then when you really got under the hood, you realize it was made by Google with HTC support. And apparently, that's going to go in the direction of LG this time instead of HTC. Very curious about that. Why do you guys think that might be? Any any any. Uh, I don't know, wild guesses. I mean, historically, they flip back and forth between the different um, you know, builders, haven't they? The, 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 the yep. what do you call it? The Nexus was LG, wasn't it? At least one of them was. Oh, yeah. They had yeah, a yeah. You know, the, Nexus, yeah. the Nexus 5 was LG. The legendary no, my, Nexus. Yeah. My favorite phone of all yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Uh, but, but, I mean, I think with the, with the Pixel universe... Um, you know, Google really wanted to make a statement and say, well, this, these aren't deals that we're making with anyone else. These are our phones. Like they want to put, they want to pull an app right. and be like, we're doing this all in house, which ties into other things that we're <laughs> hearing. This all kind of threads but, together uh, here. Think about again? What's that? They're going to buy Motorola again? <laughs> Would that be a good thing or a bad thing at this point? I don't even know. Uh, no, so apparently Google hired Apple veteran chip engineer Manu Galati after eight years with Apple. Um, Google has big plans to kind of move its chip production in-house. Galati has 27 years of industry experience. He worked 15 years at AMD and Broadcom uh, before his eight years at Apple. While he was at Apple, it coincided with the company switching to its own chips, using them in the iPad in 2010 with the A4 chip and beyond. So big time uh, kind of uh, coordinator and engineer around Apple's switch to in-house chip production. Google's bringing him on. They've also got a bunch of they've also got jobs posted uh, for other engineers on the SOC side of things. And. I mean, and what does that say for Google's hardware? You know, when it's creating its chips, we heard uh, David Burke and, you know, other Google execs at Google I.O. talking about, you know, uh, hardware embedded in the phones that they create that tie directly into things that, you know, aid in advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning and all this kind of stuff. What does it mean when Google brings all of this stuff in-house? Is it good to have it all vertically integrated the way a company like Apple does? Uh, do you think that would be a good thing for uh, for Google's efforts, Kevin? Um, well, they 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 do have some experience of building hardware, um, custom hardware themselves, but they've previously done it for data centers. So they they mm -hmm. do have a, um, a a bunch of chip experience in in that realm, but it's a very different realm than this. So it would make sense to bring someone in who knows you know this sort of low power domain much better. Um, I think I I think they 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 are big enough and they have enough money to afford to do some of this so that that does make some sense. Mm -hmm. It's a question of you know, is this what they're going to you know, now they've been pulling back from lots of lots of the moonshot stuff? Is this is this where they're going to spend the money and become more like Apple or or you know to some extent even like Microsoft? Microsoft's been doing a little bit of this as well. Yeah. So it's it's um, it makes sense if you know if you if you look at Google at the at the sort of alphabet level, it would make sense for them to to do this as a, an alphabet company, I would think. But if they're doing it as part of Google, that, that's interesting too. 
That's true. Yeah. What part of the umbrella do, uh, would this hardware at, or would it fall under Rick Osterloh? Like, is this firmly in the hardware camp or Rick Osterloh, uh, formerly of Motorola, he now uh, kind of leads the hardware division at Google. Does he oversee that whole effort, uh, especially in the sense that it all kind of ties into the hardware, like the pixel line that they're creating everything? Ron, it looked well, like well, you had something to say. Yeah, no, I was I was gonna say like I think that I think the combination of the rumor of LG making the next Pixel phone plus this hire of Manu Galati um, are all kind of indicators. Like I'm not surprised LG is is being tapped for the next Pixel phone because like Kevin said, for years they've spread the wealth. Like they they've never favored one manufacturer over the other, and I think that has been done to maintain those relationships. You know, to 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 kind of keep everybody happy, but also they're inching ever closer to the identity of the Pixel and the Google Phone. Uh, you know, like the branding on like this past time with the P Pixel was so strongly Google. It was like you know, like it was it was we knew what was under the hood, but the average person thought it was Google. And I think that hiring Manu Galati and 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 looking into doing the chipset and then maybe the hardware is again like I feel like it's a repeat of a couple of years ago, but it's Google dipping their toe back into the water of saying, okay, well what if we bring all this in-house and we do this all we don't have a partner um and i th feel like it's a very it's a it's a tightrope that they're walking because on one hand you get the sense that they really want to own a phone they really want to own the phone business if they can right they want to they want to compete with apple and samsung but on the other hand with android they have all these oems and all these partners that they need to keep happy and so it feels like they're trying to you know kind of keep both sides happy well, and the other thing is to is to map this to the rest of the sort of Google point of view on this. You know, so they've been building stuff for the data center for a long time. As I said, they've they've basically been building out custom machines to, to be data center machines. They've also built their own switches to control systems there, and now they've moved to the um, the TensorFlow, the TPU. So part of this may be drawing some of that back to if if, if they're taking this big bet on AI, it may be that they're putting it. They want to put a TPU. On, in the phone as well, and, and get that to a low power design as well. So that may make sense for them to, you know, if, if you're looking at the next generation of Android or the generation after that, that you, um, you're going to want custom chips for that. Um, and if they're going to keep up the VR stuff they're doing, they're going to want custom chips for that, that as well. So there's yeah. potentially a set of um, integrations that they want to do to make sure that, so hiring someone who's an expert at, at pulling multiple subunits together into one chip and keeping the power low is, is a very smart move from that point of view. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, and it's, it's a and it's that idea of holistic development of of that. Listen, we want a device that can do this on the software side instead of leaning on Qualcomm or whomever else that's making pro chipsets or processors or you know whatever components. Let's just oversee the components ourselves. And and who knows, you know, like maybe you know Manu Galati and the team that's working on this stuff designs the chipsets, but then they outsource the production of it to like a Foxconn or whoever else. You know, like right. there's a bunch of different ways this plays out. Yeah, I mean I, that. Yeah, spot on. Um, and they even talked about that at Google I.O., right? TensorFlow Lite was, is, not was, is their effort to bring that machine learning into the device itself. David Burke had said, you know, silicon on the device that's dedicated to this machine learning stuff um, going right. forward. So if they're creating their SOC, I mean, right now, everybody in Android is using, I mean, not everybody, but almost everybody's using Qualcomm chips in their, in their devices. And while that's great, because Qualcomm obviously is doing, you know, a, a great job creating their systems on a chip to power these smartphones it also has there's a lot of feature parity like everybody's kind of offering the same things because the chipset offers the same things google brings in its own, its own um or you know alphabet google whatever brings in their own team to create this stuff on their own they can more tightly integrate that with their efforts like tensorflow light and really create something that differentiates the hardware that they're creating uh compared to the rest so that they can coexist but we offer some and you know google's already shown that they're fine with offering things that other phones don't have you know for years that was the question is uh google doesn't want to compete with its competitors because it might scare them away you know they just they'd be too big and too dominant but now now it's obvious like Google thinks that it can coexist with its competitors and offer different things on its devices and I don't know swim in the same pool but um, so there's that also by the way LG uh, another aspect to that is that the there was a rumor that that Google uh, wanted to invest in LG's flexible OLED displays so maybe there's some mm. sort of crossover there as well um, they all seem that to would be 
Yeah. That would be wonderful. I do like flexible displays. I mean, I doubt I doubt that means you'd get your phone and you could bend it. But I think I want a phone that I can roll up and put in my pocket like a newspaper. <laughs> someday, Ron. Someday. Someday. Yeah. So I'll have it. We're just not there yet. Uh, I believe, Jason. I believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> More than likely, it'll be kind of the edging, you know, the the, the rounded edges, which is what yeah. we see right now with Samsung devices, uh, which, uh, by the way, allows for a you know less bezel in your device. That's one way to kind of make that happen, and that's one way that uh, they're they're pulling that off. So, um, well, I feel like oh man, that was a that was a lot of rumor in in one little one short. Well, and and, and the funny thing is though, what I think is really interesting is that here we are in June, and when is the Pixel announcement going to be? Like we were betting last night, like I said September, Florence Florence Ion said uh, October. Right, but we're still three months out. So if these are the rumors we're getting at least three months or so out. What is August going to be like? Oh boy, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the last hardware announcement was the beginning of October, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So if you were to follow the year, and that was late. That right was now. that that felt really late, didn't it? it? Feel, like that was yeah, yeah. It did feel a little late. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just real quick here, uh, Google has announced kind of end of life dates. <laughs> For the devices uh -huh. that you might have or that you probably have, uh, the Pixel and the Pixel XL are going to stop getting operating system updates on October 2018. So that's next October. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, those dates, like I have to imagine they'd have their successor around when when these updates stop. So it's probably October at the latest that you'd have the new devices. Um <laughs> And then security updates, October 2019. Basically, Google has has dedicated themselves on their devices to two years of OS updates, from what I understand, from what I remember, three years of security updates. Not quite as long as you get on the iOS side of things, but uh, better than before where we just didn't know. Yeah, um. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, yeah, 6P, 5X, they're going to end support September 2018. I think that's security support September of next year. Um, and then the six and the nine will stop getting security updates this October. So just right. in case you have those devices now, you know, um, mm -hmm. did I miss anything in that block? I don't know. Is this getting you did guys you excited for the next, the next wave of pixel devices? Well, I, I, I need to see more before yeah. I'm excited. I don't think I'm an excitement level yet. Um, <laughs> you know, you're, you're already all in on the essential. So. That's, I'm I'm I, I'm on the essential hype train. That's for sure. That's for sure. But uh, but also some of the you know like uh, the Google um, Google released uh, the Android O developer preview three. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. A couple of days ago, yeah. And so like that, and while that's still not. Like they, they say uh, that was a big release because it has all the APIs now and apparently they squashed a bunch of bugs, but because I'm not running it, I don't know if it's more stable. So Jason, I'm curious once you install it, whether it will make your Pixel more stable because I know you've been having stability issues. Yeah, so I updated to the Android O update at Google I.O. Basically when they announced it there, it was the official kind of move over to the automated system. So I opted into that. It took a couple of days for it to happen, uh, but I but I got it on eventually. And then, yeah, I was having a lot of weird bugs. Like I'd try and install apps from my computer. Like, you know how you can go to the Play Store on your desktop and say, install this on my phone and it would appear there and it just wouldn't install. And for whatever reason, I would restart everything. I couldn't get half the apps I wanted to install on. Um, I did get this update though. The OTA came a couple of days ago and I updated and I haven't had any issues since, but I've also kind of been not looking at my phone a whole lot. So... <laughs> So there's that too. Um, but so far, so good. Uh, I'm curious, Kevin, if you've had a chance to like look at uh, the Android O feature set or, or play around with any of the developer preview, or do you keep <clears throat> your device clean and pristine like most people do? <laughs> um, I don't normally go for the developer previews unless I've got something I'm specifically developing. Yeah. And if I would, I wouldn't do it on this one. I'd get I'd, yeah, another one to, to try that on, I think, because yeah. <laughs> you need one phone that's not falling over. I did so. I did. I did upgrade to N early, um, but that was basically because um, the previous software update managed to brick my phone, so I had to had to do that. Ah, uh, I encountered that too. That's right. The only way to like <laughs> update it was to to go to the beta. That's right. Yeah. Strange how that worked, <laughs> but it worked. Hey, I was happy that it existed because otherwise I thought my phone was dead in the water uh, for good. But yeah, so far so good. Yeah. I'm I'm happy with with the change. You know, it doesn't seem to be crashing or anything like that. So there's that, I guess. But I mean, would That's I good. recommend it for like everybody? Probably not. There's probably yeah, enough not bugs in there that 
that you don't want to jump into it unless you're cool. Yeah, with the fact that I would say I would say to wait until like like at least four, if not uh, release number five, before you start thinking about it. the closer we get to September, that's when you want to do it, Absolutely. if at all. Because it's Absolutely. a developer preview. It's a, it's not a user preview. It's a developer preview. Right, right. Um, real quick, I guess I guess what we can do, we can round out a little bit of the Android stuff, and then I have to take a break. But um, Google had just announced that uh, they're highlighting. Didn't they just do this? They're highlighting Android excellence, app, basically apps and games that are really really good in their categories <laughs> in, a, in a program called Android Excellence. So their collections uh, curated by Google. Uh, they're picking these based on you know apps and games that follow best practices, have great design, performance, optimizations, localization. I don't how, know. I how, is this, kinda... how is this any different than the uh, end of the year awards that came out six months ago? Yeah. I don't right. know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe an ongoing thing? Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure there's good apps cool. to to mine in there for the arena though yeah that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> and then you guys i know you guys talked about this last night i haven't had a chance to play around with it gboard which is the keyboard that i use on android because yep. i think it's it's kind of like google's default keyboard now right is is gboard yeah it, yeah it's really it's really the go-to i don't know if it comes pre-installed does it come pre-installed on the pixel or not but uh it should if it doesn't um, but no, this is the Gboard is interesting because it's also cross-platform in that it's both Android and iOS, which I think is great. But the the recent Gboard app uh, added the ability to uh, suggest phrases, which is something that SwiftKey had about a year ago or so. So as you're typing something, it's not only predicting the next word, but predicting the rest of the sentence based off commonly used phrases. Um, and then also the ability to draw an emoji and have it match the emoji and have that go in. So if you feel the need to draw the poo emoji, uh, you can do that. Uh, I don't really know the the drawing emoji thing. I don't know. I guess people want that. I, I like just just click just tap the emoji. Well, but, um. <laughs> I I understand it though. I understand it because yeah. I'm in this weird. I, I'm old school, right? Like I've realized. Like if I want to do a smiley face, I do the the colon and yeah, then the, the, colon the parentheses, and, yeah, and then I realize I'm totally old school. Um, you know, only only. Yeah. Yeah, just lame people do that. You got to step into the emoji age. So then I go, so then I'm like, okay, great. I'll step into the emoji age. And then I spend 10 minutes trying to find this stupid face that actually represents my feeling. I'm like, so what am I doing wrong? Like no one takes this long to find like a, a, a face that represents their emotion or do so, they? So so if you draw it, do you, do you be like, I need to express myself by drawing this emoji that I'm feeling like <laughs> if that's going to get me there quicker then yes, I will. I'm down for that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> well, what I don't understand is that why, like, so I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a heavy WhatsApp user and WhatsApp actually converts the colon and parentheses to the smiley emoji. Okay, like they're, that, yeah. So like why Gboard can't do that? I don't know. Um, but one other feature on Gboard that I do like is that they have enlarged arrow buttons to allow you to navigate text, which is fantastic because as someone with fat fingers and a small screen, yeah. and if you're trying to do edits on like a document on your phone, it's a nightmare. And so being able to go tap, tap, up, 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 left, 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 you know, like that sort of thing is a great addition as well too. So okay. I love the Gboard. It's my, it's my go-to keyboard now. So, uh, Kev ah, where, where do you stand on, you on emoji gate, <laughs> Kevin? Uh, I still use SwiftKey, and what SwiftKey has is if you type a word, it'll suggest an emoji that, that belongs with the word. So that ah, um, that yeah. that I, that is my my shortcut for it. So rather than typing, you know, shrug or whatever, rather than looking for the shrug emoji, I'll type shrug and suggest me the shrug emoji, or mm -hmm. train or poodle or whatever it is. Usually in my case, I'm, I'm trying to find the poo emoji. You'd think it would like appear easier for me and, and know that I'm looking for the poo emoji because I use it so much. That's like, but, that's yeah. like your go-to emoji, man. <laughs> no, I, I wish that it were. I just don't use emoji at all because I find it more, way more inconvenient than it than I feel like it should be. Meanwhile, we have guests here yeah, in the that's studio. The, that's, why the Swift, that's why the Swift key is good. Because <laughs> right. uh, you'll just be typing normally. It'll suggest you an emoji instead of the, along with the two words it suggests you as well. Yeah, right? that's that's the way to go about but, it. That's actually I, helpful. As I was describing, the the hours and hours it takes me to, to find a face that represents how I feel, our guests here in the studio were like, yeah, that's that's what you do. It takes yep. that long. That's just the way it goes. So apparently well, I need to just like let go of it and realize well, it's going to take I, me a long I've time done, to get that face. What I've done in this emoji filled world now is that I just use nonsense emojis. Like I'll be texting somebody <laughs> and I'll end it with the with the smiley face of the cowboy hat or I'll end it with the with with the volcano or like or the cactus. And everyone's like, what does that mean? I'm like, I don't know. You, you got to be careful, Ron. 
Yeah, exactly. you, know, you might say something and you don't have no idea what you're saying in emoji. All the better. All the better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought of a Google, Google Gboard feature. What you should do is, is you should be able to pull a face at the screen and it will give you the right emoji based on your expression. <gasps> Oh, wait a minute! Yeah. They, wait a minute! No, no, no! They no, showed Allo something did, like this off a few months ago, right? No, Allo, Allo rolled off. Uh, I think That's it's an Allo. Yes. It was a uh, facial recognition. That? And they made they made stickers based on your face. So not necessarily okay. emojis, but but more stickers like you know the kind of you know the the uh, the the bitmoji type type thing that was. Remember, Jason, you did it, and it looked kind of like you, but not totally. But yeah, kind of. yeah, yeah. And I'm not gonna go into my allo because there's a bunch of chats there, and I just don't trust myself. <laughs> not in this mind state. Um, but yes, there is a way to do that, and uh, and and it made a bitmoji thing. I thought there was a way to interpret your your face into an emoji though, and if that doesn't exist, Google. You're, you're you're the ones to make this yeah. happen. Do it. Get on that. That's important stuff. <laughs> Way more important than like so you know shaming people into getting solar panels on the roof, which we'll talk about here uh, <laughs> in a few minutes. Uh, before we move on, let's thank the sponsor of today's episode, and that is Capterra. Uh, there's a reason that you got into business. If you got into business, it, it wasn't to worry about tracking job applicants or to figure out email marketing. So it's best to not let that stuff dominate your time. There's software that can handle all of the day-to-day -day busy work for you, and you just need to find it. That's It's as easy as that. Captera helps you find and compare the software solutions for your business needs. It's an easy-to-use website, over 400 categories of software to choose from, app development, uh, business continuity, con content marketing, file sharing, human resource, web analytics, and a whole lot more. Uh, their comprehensive directory includes more than 30,000 software solutions. Enough in there to get you started, at least. Captera provides thousands of verified peer reviews and ratings for, uh, from software users who are just like you. So you'll also find articles, find reports, buying guides, all that stuff to help you in your software search. Uh, small and large businesses turn to Captera to find the right software solution. So you won't waste time sorting through search engine results. You find your software solution with Captera, and you get back to the most important thing, and that's running your business. Whether you need help with website building or customer service, every, everyone needs help with customer service, in my, my opinion, uh, or project management, Captera is the place to go. And the best part is that Captera is absolutely free. There's no obligation. You don't need to register. It's a free resource. It's going to help you make the right software decision. So do what you do better. Join the millions who use Captera every month to find software solutions for their business. Visit captera.com slash twig. And you can start your free software search today. That's captera.com slash twig. And we thank Captera for their support of This Week in Google. All right. Um, so... <laughs> Well, I teased it, so I guess we can, it's, it's by no means the top Google news, but Project Sunroof, uh, which is basically Google's <laughs> map project uh, that can tell how much sunlight is hitting your roof uh, to see... Basically, you can use this to see if, if solar panels might actually be a good fit for your home. I would love to get solar panels on my home. Actually, maybe not even solar panels, solar tiles. You know, the, the, uh, yeah. the Tesla tiles, those things are hot. Um, but anyways, this <laughs> literally, is... Literally hot. Yeah, yeah, you probably don't want to walk up there. Uh, but this is a way uh, where you can, essentially, Google is using their artificial intelligence as they use for everything, their machine learning algorithms, um, to take a look at solar imagery, uh, satellite imagery, rather, and recognize solar panels and be able to tell you if your neighbors are converted to solar or not in the hopes that, I don't know if it's the hope or not, but it's probably going to, you know, make you feel kind of bad that you aren't and then make you want to get solar converted. Didn't they do this last year though? I've got, yeah. I've got a flashback. It says, what, what changed? I think the change is the analysis, uh, the AI analysis. That's that's what, because I okay. remember this too. They, they released this a few years ago and I think then basically what it was was a way to determine how much sun actually hits your roof. Uh, throughout exactly, a given right. day to determine whether it would be a good idea for you to get it. And now what they're doing is they're training their AI to determine who's done it 
and who hasn't so that you feel guilty and you get solar uh, on your roof. But, but how do you feel guilty if you're not checking it? <laughs> well, that's true. Who's, right? like if, who's if actually checking aware. it? It's a good yeah, point. If I'm not aware of it, then uh, then how would I be be feel shamed? You know, like, yeah. no, but I think this is cool because like maybe you see your neighbor and you're like, you've done it and you're like, oh, cool. If my whole block does it, then we can save this X amount and you want to talk your neighbors into it or whatever. But uh, yeah, this just looks like an evolution of what they did last year. That's that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. It's yeah. it's this growing trend. Can, can it detect those Tesla roofs? <laughs> I know. It right? look like ordinary roofs. <laughs> oh, man, those yep. things are hot. I, I want those so bad. Um, but we don't need a new roof at this point on our house. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I don't know if I could justify that. I'd have to go with the solar panels. Basically, Tesla says, if you already need a new roof, this is the way to go. Cost effective, you know, right. from cost effectiveness, uh, you might as well replace it with this. And over time, it'll pay for itself. If you don't need a new roof, you might as well stick with panels. But man, they look nice with those solar tiles. Hey, listen, ju just because that's the conventional wisdom, Jason, doesn't mean you have to stick to it. If you want those sure. tiles... I want you to have the tiles. Yep, they're expensive. <laughs> they, yeah, I know. <laughs> someday, maybe someday, maybe I'll win the lottery, although I don't play the lottery. Who knows? Uh, anyways, that was probably not the, the top uh, Google story. Let's see. What do we have in here? There aren't really a whole lot of top Google stories, to be honest. So I'll just kind of start up here at the top. Uh, Google's, you know, the, the, the little uh, self-driving cars, the really... The, the totally characteristic, I, I think they had some promo videos, the little two seaters, yep. people get in them. They look like these little futuristic pods. They're auto, they're autonomous vehicles. And they were basically Google's way of showing what the, you know, autonomous uh, driving future may look like. They began testing on roads back in 2014. Apparently those are going away. Yeah. Those little guys, Aww. the firefly. Yeah. Is yeah, going they're basically away. golf cons, aren't they? I mean, they're yeah, <laughs> more yeah, than they, anything, that's probably what it does. like, yeah, they only went like 25, 30 miles an hour, right? So <laughs> yes. top speed, 25 miles per hour. You're not going very fast, but there is a stop and go button inside. And I appreciate it for its simplicity. Uh, apparently they logged in uh, 3 million miles in three years and Google slash Alphabet has decided it's probably best to just focus all of its efforts on the thing most people have heard of, which is Waymo, which is uh, taking the roads by storm at this point or about to and and the courtrooms uh, that too yeah there's there's some, <laughs> there's some stuff going down with Wayne, waymo in the courtrooms and uber yeah and a whole lot more about uber but we don't need to talk about that um google drive apparently uh is i think this is a great idea although i wonder how expensive it would get over time but google um is going to release a new app called backup and sync they're going to release it on june 28th and basically what it's going to be designed for is is uh pointing it to any file or folder or sorry folder not file folder on your drive or number of folders and have continuous sync uh backup to the cloud when i read this i was like man i i just assumed that they already did that but i guess they don't i think they did that in photo upload but not in just general file upload yeah, no, I, I don't think they've ever done the entire thing, like the, like a true Dropbox style kind of backup kind of situation. Um, but hey, man, well, I've done, I would, I would done it with folders, surely. Yes, yeah, photos for photos. sure. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 but no folders. You got to got to. Oh, you photo, could. Photo. Yeah. Okay, so then this is meant to be. At least I've had that before. Yeah. So yeah. I'm slightly confused. Okay, so they say that they're replacing the Google Drive app and the Google yep. Photos backup app on desktop. With this, so it's probably going to do what it's done before. Also, the photos backup. Um, yeah. The, oh, I see. Okay. No, because I mean, the other, the, the, I've had the opposite problem, which is that if I install Google Drive, then my hard drive fills up because my Google Drive has got more stuff on it than my computers have. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Because I, because I got a terabyte with, with the with, um, whatever it was with the with the Chrome. Um, the Chrome Pixel right. years ago, so I just threw everything in it, and then I bought a new Mac, and it had didn't have enough storage to sync to it. <laughs> so you still have a terabyte from when you bought the Pixel? When you got um, the Pixel? no, it expired at Google I/O last year, so now I'm paying them for it. Oh, okay. 
I was like, wow, you got off easy if you still have that. That's awesome. No, that, was, that was the irony. So it was like it was Google I.O. week and suddenly I, my, my, all my Google things were saying, you are, you are out of disk space by a factor of 10. You <laughs> oh, need to geez. delete like 90% of your stuff. And it's like, it's I.O. week, Google. Oh, right. Yes, my three-year freebie just expired. Now I've got to start paying you. Damn. But isn't that how they get you, right? There's there's actually totally related news to this. Amazon uh, got rid of their unlimited file storage. They had, you know, a few years ago rolled out their unlimited cloud storage plan. They're ending that. Uh, if you have an existing unlimited storage plan, you won't lose it until the renewal. But then at that point, you'll be downgraded essentially to a one terabyte plan and you'll have to pay extra $59.99 per extra terabyte um, or eleven ninety nine dollars uh, per 100 gigs per month. And then if you don't purchase any extra data after like six months, all that data just disappears. But it's but it's an interesting strategy that we're that we're seeing where I, I think there are there is a certain population of people that saw unlimited and thought unlimited forever. But of course, forever never lasts forever. Forever does not mean unlimited. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> forever is not forever when it's talking when you're talking about unlimited, nor is unlimited actually unlimited when you're talking about unlimited. Um but anyways, so it's a great way to get you in the door. But then what are you going to do? All your data is up there. Now you have to decide, is it worth it for you to pay <laughs> or do you just kiss it goodbye? You chose to pay. It was important enough for you to keep in the cloud. Well, it, well, it was it was either that or spend a week deleting 90% of my stuff. So <laughs> exactly. No. Or, or about that to, to, to download all the local drives. But <laughs> Put you to work. But basically. I mean, it's like... But, I've already delegated photos and music to Google. I mean, you know, th yeah. th those those two, they don't have a limit on. You you just they, they just let you back stuff up. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, yeah, all my photos, sure, all my music from you know that I've got downloaded lots of my machines, sync that up to Google. That's fine. And then my phone doesn't have to have it on. Right. And I trust them to back it up because they're Google. They don't actually delete things unless they unless something terrible happens. You know, they don't even delete yeah. things if you tell them to delete things. So. Um, you know, by default, Google has six copies of everything in, in more than, and it's in more than one data center and more than one continent. So it's quite hard to lose stuff that you backed up to Google. As long as you don't lose access to your Google account, everything's okay. As long as you don't enable. <laughs> Just said. It's all yep. wine and roses until you it's, do it's, something stupid. Until you get locked out of your Google account. Yep. Until you get locked well, out of your Google would, account, it's all gone. How would that happen? That would never happen. It would never happen. <laughs> Except that it did on this very show. What was uh, it? It was it was two factor authentication plus Google Voice. Right? Yes, that was it was the, a toxic was a combination. Combo. It was a yep, deadly yep. combination. Um, yeah. Well, okay. So you brought up Google Photos. This is not in the doc, and it's totally not related to much other than Google Photos. But this is something I was struggling with yesterday. So Google I/O. Uh, we were given one of the one of the few gifts that attendees were given were was a 20 page hardcover photo book from Google photos or whatever. They're like a free photo book. Cool. You choose the photos. We'll give you a free photo book. Um, and so I went into my photos and my wife and I were like, you know, we never actually got our wedding photos in a book. So this is a perfect opportunity to do that. Let's do that. <laughs> so I go into Google photos. I mean, I've got like, we've got like a thousand photos. We got a, we had a really great, um, ph photographer that we hired. It was one of the things that we spent the most money on was the photographer. Cause we we're like, you know, this is the thing you're going to remember forever. So you might as well have it look nice. And it turns out that all of my photos, all of our photos from their wedding are duplicated and the duplicates are sideways. So there's some of them, are, you know, half of them are the right orientation. Half of them are sideways, but but the same. Google can do so much with artificial intelligence. Is it is it difficult to like detect that a photo is sideways and automatically swap it up? And if not, they Google have, do they that. They have one of those. I've, de I've definitely seen that in the assistant tab. It says, these photos are sideways. Should I rotate them for you? But it does that But so, it does that automatically. How do I do that? How do I say go back into my patch? library? Yeah, 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 going front. That's a good it. question. I'm not sure you can. Maybe I can. I'm not sure you can ask them to do that. That's true. Maybe I, maybe I can. Yeah. Or, yeah. Here, have, you, have you looked on the desktop version like that, of Google yeah. Photos what, as what, opposed to the app? What's that, Ron? Have you looked at the desktop version of Google Photos as opposed to the app? Yeah, I, I, I looked at both, but um, okay. And and you know there there's like a keyboard shortcut for rotating, so that helps. It's Shift R if you're looking at a single photo. Shift R that'll rotate it, so you don't have to find the button. Um, but I just wanted to be like, look at all of these and rotate all of these. <laughs> And uh, someone in chat posted a thing from the app. Is this a way that you can manually do it? 
like fire it I've, off. I've definitely seen one of the. Yeah, I've definitely seen an assistant thing that said that found because I had a bunch of old ones from like you know fifteen years ago that that, that were all the wrong way around. And it said these are all rotated the wrong way. Do you want to fix that? And I said yes, and they were rotated. But I, I, the problem with the assistant is you can't tell it to do things. It it is just yeah. like sitting there like right. gripping your photos and making sure that. Yeah, if it can't detect it, it's not going to do it. And there must be something in those photos that is making it think it's not sideways. Well, and whether it could be the orientation of a face or something like that, you know, like it's, you know, machine learning is great, but you can still fool it at some point. Oh, man, there's there's no denying like the majority of these things are head to toe. We're just standing sideways. Obvious. So maybe <laughs> oh, it, maybe it thinks we're all laying down. I don't know. Anyways, totally random. Uh, it looks like, I mean, maybe I can go in here because I know sometimes you can go into the Photos app and you can select a bunch of photos. Well, you do it with photo books. You select a bunch of photos and then you go into the menu and you hit, you know, photo book. Maybe there's something in there to trigger an auto-rotate uh, an analysis or something, but I didn't see it yesterday. And I tried on desktop and mobile because um, I have I have gotten, um, received that assistant card before for rotating photos but yeah obviously didn't get to these so anyways uh a little bit of a tangent thank you for coming along with me on that journey um this <laughs> this was interesting <laughs> alphabet finally found a buyer for boston dynamics i think they've been trying to unload yeah. their robots for about a year now and now softbank uh, is the proud owner of a whole bunch of robots. Also, not only uh, Boston Dynamics, but Shaft, which was also an Alphabet property that you probably heard a lot less about. They were also creating robots. They had released a bipedal um, robot last year, or at least a video of one last year that was designed to help carry heavy loads. So kind of doing some similar stuff to what Boston Dynamics was, but maybe maybe a little bit smaller, more compact. I'm not really quite sure. Um, I, I think the first thing I thought of when I read this is that there's no chance I'm ever going to run into a Boston Dynamics robot at Google I.O. It's just not going to happen now. And Ron, that makes yeah. me sad. Well, I, I, I'm glad because the bipedal robots freak me out and, um, <laughs> or, or, or they, they, they freak me out almost as much as the quadpedal robots, like the, the dog, the dog robots, those freak me out the most. Um, but I'm more interested in, it just seems like every time something interesting is happening, it seems SoftBank is involved. SoftBank's and really involved. SoftBank yeah. is really in, like they, they're really and they're, there's all this stuff about how they're restructuring this 93 billion dollar tech fund and and doing you know and and they 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 invested in Sprint and they 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 pulled the investment from Essential like it just seems that like SoftBank SoftBank keeps coming up in these kind of interesting tech stories and I'm curious what are they going to do with Boston Dynamics and Shaft like that's really kind of interesting so My who knows. Masayoshi Son, uh, chairman and CEO of SoftBank Group Corp, said in a statement, smart robotics are going to be a key driver of the next stage of the information revolution. Yep. That kind of, like, I don't know what that means. Does that mean that these robots are going to be delivering my information on a platter or <laughs> what that means? But, um, I mean, there's no, no doubt robotics are, you know, a future or a part of our future. Um I don't know. Do you have any? Do you have any thoughts? Any uh, any theories on why a company like SoftBank might want want robots, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I mean, you know, robots have been a, a, a sort of a cool thing in Japan for years, so true, it true. makes sense for a Japanese company to pick it up. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's one. Of, it's one of those. It's one of those bizarre things. It's like you know. Those those robots seem really cool, but also seem really weird and off putting. They're a bit too uncanny valley for me. Yes, mm -hmm. agreed. That's, that's agreed. why they're awesome. That's, I know. No, <laughs> that's why they're <laughs> awesome and scary all at the same time. <laughs> but, you, the, but if you look at sort of Asimo and Ibo and the, the Japanese style ones, they they put a lot of effort into making them cute and friendly. That's true. Whereas the Boston ones were just like they were just scary. They just look like, you know, evil robot dogs rather than cuddly robot dogs. Yeah, they they definitely had a military <laughs> edge to them. Uh, yeah. like you could definitely see those out on a battlefield somewhere. Um, oh no. Yeah. And I just, I just, I just see the star Wars prequels. So I don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the future, Ron. It's the future. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, speaking of, of, uh, you know, Toyota, Osimo, Osimo is Toyota, right? Uh, is it Osimo? I think is what it was called. Uh, yeah. Toyota had apparently been in the running, uh, or according to reports as well on, uh, on buying Boston dynamics. They just, they lost out to SoftBank. 
So Osimo's just going to have to be cued on his own. Osimo was, was Honda, by the way. Oh, was it that was Honda? Honda? Sorry, I got it. was it. Honda. Got yep, that wrong. Yep. The world's most advanced humanoid robot. It's pretty cool, but not nearly as as frightening as as Big Dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, I just I really hope the SoftBank keeps up the tr the tradition and allows Boston Dynamics to continue to release the videos because pretty much it's like Christmas anytime Boston Dynamics releases a new video of their robots. <laughs> Every time I open it and I watch it and I mouth agape and I'm like, this is actually happening. This I like. I once thought that this would just be science fiction, but no, here it is invading my know, nightmares. I don't know how that's Christmas, or for me, that's like the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> Every time I see one of those new Boston Dynamics videos of the robot walking awkwardly and like and, and like not falling down, and oh, it's creepy. <laughs> or being kicked and it doesn't fall yeah. down and it comes out. Yep, that one. Yep. <laughs> that one. That one's a little scary. Uh, if you like your material. Uh, as part of your design, then you might like the fact that more material design is coming to Chrome OS. Canary Channel apparently is getting a new material notification design. Uh, more streamlined, round, <laughs> rounded corners, cleaner icons, condensed actions, and uh, that's about uh, all there is. As long as it's not like small and too gray and illegible like they've done on Android. Oh, I, really? I want, I want. I want a high contrast, larger type back in my notifications, please. That's, that's true. They're getting so elegant that you need you need a, a pair of bifocals <laughs> to even read them. <laughs> yes, because like, they're, they're why condensing is the main all that text on these things gray? Yes. <laughs> there's, there's no excuse for that. <laughs> Doesn't pop, but it looks nice. No. Uh, if you want to get in on that action, you can. You just have to enable a flag. Just do a search for it. Uh, get on Canary, of course, and you can enable a flag, and uh, that's all there is to that. Uh, I know you guys talked a little bit about local guides last night on All About Android, something that I still only sort of really understand, this local guides yeah. thing with maps. And I didn't even realize that actually uh, Florence Ion was like a, a level three local guide. Like oh, she's wow. participated in this, which is crazy. But yeah, no, but basically it's just kind of, you know, um, it's, it's Google, Google's kind of crowdsourced um, information about locations within maps. Uh, and, you know, it allows people to, you know, add information and answer questions and things like that. I, you know, I do the things in Google Maps where you answer questions about places, but I don't know what level I am. I don't even know if that's even tied to local guides. I know local guides have been around for a while, yeah. but, um, you know, it's it's clearly a program that's working well for them because here they are, they're adding five more levels, which brings it to a lo t total level of 10, uh, and in hopes to kind of keep everybody incentivized to keep using it, to keep the gamification going. Um, and they give rewards, like you get uh, free months of Google Play Music and discounted rentals and stuff like that so it's a uh, pretty neat but uh, it's not something i have any like i barely have time to work on my projects much less google's projects yeah so. right exactly <laughs> a couple of free months of google play music don't they just offer that every other month anyways for yep. things yep. um well that's it yeah I, I, it's kind of weird because it keeps nagging me to do that it's like okay you're at this place do you want to tell me about it? it's like no i don't oh, want to yeah. tell you about it but well, I, the way I look it's at it is that I, pro true. I participate. I, I, I participate agree. in that because I, the way I see it is like this is information I would want to know. Like when I, because I go to Google Maps all the time and look up like what are the dollar signs are when the, the when is this place busy like all that sort of stuff. And so I figure you got to pay it forward a little. You got to I got to give some information as well too. So it says like, does this place take credit cards? And I say I don't know, and then I move on. You know, so <laughs> pay it well, forward I mean, I, with uncertainty. I suppose, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've already done that with Foursquare, so it feels like I'm having to do it twice. It's like, you know, can yeah. you just like talk to Dennis and get some data from him? <laughs> yeah, I know. No, I know. I completely agree. I get that notification or I'll arrive somewhere and then I look, I get a buzz and look down at my phone and there it is. Like it knows that I arrive, arrived there. It's one of those moments where it's like, ah. but I mean, but, uh, you know, props for it actually getting it right. I just, I never apparently afford myself the time to actually do very much with it unless it's a really quick, like, yes, no. But to like so type out a review is just, I, I never give myself the time to do that. It's important to note, though, that those questions we're talking about are a function of Google Maps in terms of crowdsourcing information. Those are not local guides. Um, I just went to maps.google.com slash local guides, and you actually have to actually join and tell it what city you're in and agree, you know, kind of agree to their terms and all stuff like that. You got to choose to join. And once you do that, then you can submit information about places and locations and things like that. And it's kind of like it's basically like Google's Yelp baked into Google Maps. Got it. Um, 
Uh, but still, but it gives you that really kind of in-depth information, and that's how they do the rewards and all things like that. I think it's cool. It's interesting, I, and I'm glad that they're doing it. I just don't know why. Like, it's the kind of thing like – you know, Jason, you and I are so close to all this stuff, and I just learned that right now in the past two minutes. You know, like it's not something that's like widely popularized. They don't bubble it up within the Google Maps app that much, which I th thought they would do. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, they do. It's pretty. Yeah. I, I see it all the time. Do, do you not get that? Oh, you know, I get if it, I but I don't know. I, I don't know that these people are local guys and what levels they are and things like that. Oh, I see. You know, like yeah, the, yeah, yeah, you know that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've got you. Yeah, like how you would even know to to jump in there, but I guess. Uh, Man, is this the thing? I feel I feel like at some point I heard about it where um, if you are already contributing a lot, if you're just kind of that person that likes to contribute a lot, then you you get contacted and it's like you can be yeah. part of the local guides and that's when you get in on on kind of these bonuses. And for what I understand, yeah. like it was five stages before and the problem is like their best users would get to the fifth stage, the fifth level or whatever, they'd level up. And then oh, that, that's about as high as you could get. And it's like, okay, well, what is my incentive to continue contributing? <laughs> now they've added five more levels so that you can continue to get more as you contribute yep. more. And yeah. that, you know, gives other users more information to pull from, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, in our constant march towards an AI uh, ruled future, the New York Times apparently it has enlisted Alphabet AI to <laughs> to help it moderate its comments. Uh, hey, more power to the AI that can moderate comments because I have to imagine that's not an easy task. But um, but it's actually really interesting. Uh, only ten percent of New York Times articles allow for comments at this at least prior to this because the task of moderating all of those comments yeah. with the limited staff that they have dedicated to it i mean it just take too much time uh so they could only allow comments for 10 percent of their articles alphabet steps in uh with their jigsaw division they, they created a tool called perspective that is allowing the new york times to expand the number of articles that they're um they're allowing comments on. They plan to open up commenting on 80% of the articles. And when you consider somewhere around 200 articles per day being posted, that's quite a lot of moderation. They're, the New York Times articles get a lot of comments when you go to one that has comments uh, activated. So the AI algorithm essentially is scanning for known you know, things that would trigger a flag and then it can kind of pass things off as need be to human moderators to make the calls or whatever. But it's just trimming... Trim, you know, trimming the easy stuff, uh, let, letting most of it pass if it passes, and if not, kind of passing the the questionable stuff off to humans. So, AI taking one for the team. In this case, if, someone, if I, someone's going to read, if someone's going to read the comments, it might as well be a robot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I like the, the comment was it says that I like was the tool sometimes proved imperfect, missing some modern slurs. <laughs> Love the idea that we've got um, continually reinventing slurs on other people to get past the robots. Yes, there's one thing we know about the internet. Can you, can you be more creative in your abuse, please? Right, come up with something new, and let's all jump on that bandwagon before the robot catches us. But this uh, is—I mean, it's like the, the the Twitter thing now, where Twitter will censor certain words um, unless you're verified, um, but won't censor certain other words. So somebody can be very rude to you, and then you you get crossed back, and then you're blocked for twelve hours. Right. Yep. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes that works effectively and sometimes it goes rogue. Um, so yep. I guess you never really know what you're going to get when, when the robots take over. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I think, let's see. I know that there's more, but it's probably not in the Google section here. Uh, we talked about the Amazon. What am I missing? Does anything jump out? Well, I guess Facebook has some interesting uh, stuff along these lines and actually very, um, very timely right now. There's obviously some pretty crazy stuff happening, uh, in London with the, uh, with the high, the high rise that was on fire. And, um, yep. yeah, it's just really devastating news. Um, Facebook has its safety check feature that it's implemented a while back. That's basically all around kind of alerting other Facebook users, whether someone is, okay or not and they've, they're basically pushing out a number of new features to this one of them um ties into fundraising so essentially essentially i guess facebook already kind of has a fundraising um a program integrated into its service so this is kind of tying it into safety check so 
if safety check is activated for someone, it, this would allow someone to essentially kick off a nonprofit or a personal fundraising effort that might help around a scenario like this. Uh, thankfully, all of those efforts are vetted by by Facebook's humans, essentially, uh, pri prior to that actually happening. But um, yeah, I mean, that's that's got to be a good thing in, in the case of, of a of a tragedy or a disaster of, of some sort. We're seeing face safety check happen more and more. Uh, TechCrunch had an, had an article that's really timely about kind of today's news or yesterday's news, um, wondering if safety check does more harm than good. And I think it's kind of an interesting question because I hadn't really yeah. considered it. I figured, you know, it's, it's, it's a network that has c contact with a whole lot of people. So it would make sense that they would know whether someone might be in harm's way or not would, you know, be there to alert uh, their, their loved ones or their friends, whether they're okay or not. That seems like a great thing. The article in, in TechCrunch is kind of asking the question, like, does it cause undue panic and undue worry depending on how wide of a net it casts based on who is targeting for safety check or not? Did, I, I don't know if either of you had a chance to to take a look at this because it's a little bit of a dense yeah, read, but it's an interesting question. Well, I, I do recognize the problem because we we had that with both the, um, the the terrorist attack in London and this this fire thing, where basically it's asking you know a large proportion of the population of London whether they're they're involved in this. Whereas and those those were both scary things, but the number of people involved in each was you know a few hundred at most. Um, but it's asking, you know, five million people to to, to check in and, and give safety check responses, which is which is a bit bizarre. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the challenge of of a dense pop densely populated area like a major city like London, where you know it's a combination of where the app picking up where you are from your location as well as where you tell it you are. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, you know, and, and then like the times I've seen safety check in action have been like during a lot of the tornadoes in the Midwest and things like that, where people kind of mark themselves as okay. Those are kind of cast a wider net. And it's more you could there's more wondering if somebody in Kansas is going to get hit by this tornado or not than this localized terrorist attack that happened on it within a couple of blocks radius in London. Um, I don't know. I think it does, I, I, I think for if you have. So, I mean, it is tricky because, yeah, you know, if it happens somewhere in central London, the the terrorist attack on, on Tower Bridge and Borough Market, that is an area that, that I've been to lots of times. Lots of people have been to. My sons work near there. So there, there's some reason for us that they could have been in the neighborhood. But yeah. the, the, you know, the, the the idea that, you know, I was still seeing um, people marking themselves safe two days later and things, which which was, which was kind of weird. Huh. So it, it, felt, it felt like they'd, they'd got the... The, the focus wrong and, and the other half is is when the disaster does happen then everyone everyone who who knows you will will, will check in anyway um yeah. and when we were living in california whenever there was a a, a mudslide or a fire our relatives would say Are you okay and we're like yeah that's 200 miles away that way um so that there is that sort of it, it's it's behaving more like your sort of um geographically confused relatives than <laughs> than you know than facebook you know facebook is tracking where you are all the time if you if you're running the Apple Messenger. So it it it, it could do a much more focused job of saying, okay, this person was very close to that neighborhood or, or was close to that neighborhood at, at some point in the last two days, and that and, and do a better job than it does. What I've seen seems to do is prompt anyone within you know a mile radius or two mile radius, which yeah, in London is a million people literally. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the examples uh, from this article was that you know, it's 120 flats in this in this London high rise that were on fire. People as far away as eight miles were being prompted to check in. And what kind of a signal does that send to the people on the other end that see this check in? You know, it, it, where where they yeah. might not have been worried or concerned, now suddenly they feel like there's need to be worried or concerned, and it just kind of sp potentially spreads this kind of. I don't know, a feeling of, of panic where maybe it didn't need to be. Right. At the same time, like I'm, I'm conflicted because I'm like, yeah, but it's nice to use data that you have, information that you have to do some, to, to attempt to do some greater good. Maybe it's just not being used as efficiently or as effectively as it, as it should be for this tool. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I think I think the expansion of safety check, you know, in terms of with fundraising is interesting because I know that, um, you know, fundraising. I saw an article recently, like go, like what was it, something crazy about GoFundMe? How 
the majority of go like 80 percent of gofundme oh no more than half of gofundme's money that's raised through crowdfunding goes towards medical expenses hmm. right and yes. so this idea this idea of crowdfunding in need and around disasters and around when things happen and things like that that's you know like clearly facebook is doing that in order to help you know but also there's 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 a business there you know so I think that's interesting as well too. Looking at the what they what other functionality they can build on around safety check, as flawed as it might be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hadn't heard that news about GoFundMe. Nine, uh, the medical campaigns oh, yeah. make up nine hundred thirty million dollars of the two billion dollars raised on GoFundMe. Yep, isn't that wow. crazy? Wow. It, it is. And I think that's yeah, no, that, crazy. That, that's a, that says that says more about healthcare than than about <laughs> safety check. <laughs> so. Well, the power of, of crowdfunding, I mean, yeah. you know, which is, and, and that ties exactly right into what Facebook had announced with their changes or with their updates to safety check, which is in a time of need, sometimes, you know, personal fundraising is necessary, uh, let's say. Yeah. And so they're, they're including that into here. Uh, it was, it was an interesting, the TechCrunch article was definitely an interesting read. I just hadn't thought of it that way before. I've been like, well, this is, this is obviously a good thing, right? Like tell people yeah. whether you're safe or not, but if it's used in, if it's used too widely, uh, it can almost work in the opposite direction. So apparently they have some work to do there to kind of tighten it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then let's see here. What, what other crazy things are, is Facebook doing? <laughs> Meanwhile, I wouldn't know. I haven't been on Facebook since December. Uh, just throw <laughs> that out there. Uh, Facebook wants you to type with your brain. This isn't weird at all. Uh, they have first announced this at F8 in April, uh, that neuroscientists and engineers, uh, apparently are a little doubtful that, that Facebook could pull this off, but Facebook is investing millions of dollars in research anyways, into the idea that we could someday uh, <laughs> share our thoughts uh, to Facebook, I'm guessing. It's part of gr the greater effort within Building 8, which is the incubator for moonshots at Facebook that if you remember Regina Duggan, once uh, ATAP at Google has shifted over to, this is one of her, I'm assuming, many products, uh, projects that they're working on, moonshots. To get us using, to get us wearing a headband and transferring our thoughts into Facebook, that doesn't have any potential, you know, sc scary consequences whatsoever that I could possibly think of. Wasn't wasn't this an idea? Wasn't this a, a, a moonshot pitch in uh, Silicon Valley when Big Head Probably. was working at uh, Big Head was working at um, uh, Huli? <laughs> It, 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 was, it was like, yeah, wouldn't it be cool if whatever you thought just type, typed? And they're like, oh, can we do that? He's like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> That's what the moonshot department is about. If you think it, yep. we can tr throw money at it. Um, wh one question I had about this when I was reading through it is, do are our thoughts structured like sentences? <laughs> You know, what I mean? like if it could read my thoughts, is it really like I'm thinking about something? It'd be like I was thinking about it, uh, whatever. Like yeah. I, I don't know. Like you probably have to learn how to how to type like. Well, this. Well, I, I suspect it's more like you know the suggestions you already get in Allo or um, Gmail or wherever else is is making up little replies for you, and it'll just pick one of those from its, from its bucket of um, pseudo human replies. Yeah. Um, I think that the 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 more interesting thing is um, that. About this is Charlie um, Charlie Strauss, the sci-fi author, wrote about a while back, basically saying um, 2007 is when the human species accidentally invented telepathy, um, because we're now communicating through Twitter and Facebook and all these, you know, di disclosure induction social media um, with little things in our hands all the time. So basically, all our thoughts are being sprayed out to the net and, and read to each other all over the time. And his, his, you know, his his argument on this is, and this was he wrote this in um, January 2016, is that this is going to have really strange effects on politics. And I think that's huh. that's about right. <laughs> you know, if you look what's happened over the last two years in politics, yes, that that is exactly what's been going on. There is this strange ability, you know, because. We can actually communicate thoughts with each other and therefore ramp each other up into these loops of um, I have a wild idea. You have that wild idea, too. Let's all spread it out. And those sp spray themselves around to social media and, and then spread into mainstream media and get taken up by political parties and all these, these things happen. Um, there's, there's, there's a, the, the world has got very strange very fast. And I have and, not thought of it like that before. My mind is, is slightly blown because it, like when I think of telepathy, I think of it in the way, you know, of this article. But I mean, you're absolutely right. Like the, 
the barrier for passing along a thought, we, I mean, we, it, it's just part of our daily nature, right? Like we have a thought, we act on that thought by pulling out our phone, punching out that thought into, a, you know, into words and sending it out. And now everybody knows that thought. That's just the way that life is in this strange technological world that we live right now. It's not very far removed from just having thoughts be transcribed onto a screen automatically. It's almost right. the same thing. Well, uh, but no, but I, but I, I think it, it's a little, I mean, it's not far removed, but it's removed enough because if you've got un, I mean, cause there's a filter there. There's there is the a decision, filter for sure. There's the, there's the action of typing the letters and building the thought and doing it as opposed to the unfiltered kind of your thoughts being transcribed, because I'm feeling that if we could directly telepathically, tele telepathically transcribe our thoughts and tweet them, the world would, would be much more disturbing than even as disturbing <laughs> as it is now. And as, as much as as we think that some people are are doing that now by just saying Im immediately what they think and tweeting it yeah. there's still a level of barrier that happens and i would be even more scared to see what those people would tweet telepathically with no filter uh <laughs> just imagine what they actually think but oh uh yeah. Um, yeah. no but I, I but i love i love this i love that they're investigating this as a moonshot i love this as a con as a concept it's real sci-fi but it's also like you know, I hate handwriting because I because I've used computers for so much, and I'm now at the point now where my wrist gets tired, and I hate typing. And as much as as I know a lot of writers who lean on like drag and dictate and other kind of voice, you know, speech recognition stuff. But to be able to just sit there and look at something and have your thoughts get transcribed into text would be like amazing and would be able to make you know writing that much faster and easier and just like imagine what it could unlock you know aside from just our unfiltered thoughts of you know for twitter or whatnot the the productivity i think would increase of you know uh, you know could george R. R. martin finally finish that game of thrones book if all he had to do was look at the computer and think about the story right that, that that's but pretty no, cool but that's part of the problem. but the thing is if you're you know if you're a professional writer or even if you're not these days you you a lot of people are very fast at typing and, and have a very direct line between their, their hand and their keyboard or their hand and their, um, you know, the, t the touchpad or, yeah. you know, or, or, or will they use voice dictation and, and have got have trained themselves into a feedback loop with the computer to, to speak in a way that gets transcribed well. Whereas, if right. I, you know, if I if you try and transcribe me talking at the pace I'm talking at the moment, um, Google falls over and I have to go back and correct it. So I'm better off typing. Yeah. But right. the, you know, whereas if you if you've taught yourself to speak at that at the pace that Google is happy with and space out the words a bit more, then it will transcribe it reasonably reliably. Um, so, but the, the, the point is, is more that we have, we have, it's not just about the, you know, the gap between, the, the hard problem is not the gap between your brain and getting into the computer, because we have four or five ways of doing that, all of which are, are pretty much close enough these days. Um, but it, the, the weird thing that's changed is the ease of anyone being able to see that and spread that to other people. Mm -hmm. And that's the bit that, that feels more like telepathy where, um, and also, you know, you, you will see the news and you will think of a joke and go to tweet it and find that that joke's already trending because everyone has had the same thought as well, which is the other sort of bizarre mirror <laughs> part of this. That's really true. I mean, yeah, that's that's another aspect. Yeah, I hadn't <laughs> considered, right? Like it's super, and, and that's wh why you see a lot of this like reactionary uh, behavior on social media. It is so easy to see someone's thought and in a split second decide, I agree with that thought. Boom. Now everybody else knows that yeah. I agreed with it because I've spread it yep. and that network effect extends far and wide. And that's, that's a direct tie right there. That's yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah, man, more and more. I'm just not sure. I'm not sure about this newfangled technology, this social media stuff. <laughs> it's ruining everything. <laughs> <laughs> Am I getting old? Is that what's yes, happening? Get off. I'm getting old. <laughs> get off my lawn, you kids. <laughs> Just let me draw my emoji. Dang it. <laughs> um, we've got tips. We've got tricks. We've got numbers. I'm not sure what we have, actually, to be honest, after this break. But we're going to take a break. Yeah, it looks like we all have picks. Excellent. Uh, we're going to do the picks here in a second. Let's thank the sponsor of today's episode of This Week in Google. And that is Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. I don't know if you've done the mortgage process before, if you've ever bought a home or refinanced a home. It's not always that easy. It's not always that straightforward. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. And that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgages to make your life a little bit easier. 
Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or even refinancing your existing home loan. Uh, it's simple. It allows you to fully understand all of the details because there can be a lot of details in the mortgage process and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient, which is absolutely what you want. We live in the digital age, so we want more and more convenience. It's just part of how we do business online. Uh, their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. So you don't have to go diving for you know information, paperwork, all that kind of stuff uh, in the real world. You, you, they make it convenient for you and make it easy. Uh, it's powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds so you can be up to date you can fit you can kind of tweak your own scenario and find what's just right for you uh, it's based on your income your assets your credit rocket mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options uh, for which you qualify and then find the one that's just right for your scenario rocket mortgage by quicken loans apply simply understand fully mortgage confidently to get started go to rocketmortgage.com slash twig that's rocketmortgage.com slash twig, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of This Week in Google. All right. All three of us have picks this time around. Uh, Kevin, why don't we go with your pick or picks? You you might have a couple. I don't know. Well, I've, I have three related ones. So, right. you know... Th <laughs> so in, indie web is the is the the, the group i i um help organize and um basically the goal is to get people to have their own websites again and to um find ways to connect between those websites so you don't have to do everything through twitter or facebook but you can have your your practical telepathy in, on your own website too um <laughs> and the um there are a bunch of indie web camp uh, homebrew website clubs tonight um, you've probably missed already the, the UK one is, is already finished. Um, but we have Bellingham, Washington, San Francisco and Fort Collins, Colorado, um, tonight, um, coming up at, at five 30. So check the, the link there for those, the, the, the San Francisco ones at Mozilla, um, Bellingham is yeah, at the foundry and, and so on. I think a, a, fr a friend of mine's involved in the San Francisco one, Kevin. I think uh, my friend Tontek is involved in the indie web oh, yes. uh, stuff. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, he's great. Yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm. I, I strongly recommend uh, uh, indie web. It's awesome. So yes, yeah, yeah Tontek's a great friend of mine too, and um, he hosts it at Mozilla when he can, and it is there tonight. And so it's worth yeah. going down there because it's a, it's a, and it starts at five thirty. Um, quiet writing hour, six thirty. You hang out and talk about. You built your website. It's not. It's not quite website addicts club, but it's. It's like I built my website, and here's what I've. Here's what I've done. Um, I need help with this. Um, or have you thought of doing this? It's. It's. It's like a. A, a sort of self help group for, for web building, and then the Indie Web Summit um, is June twenty fourth to twenty fifth. So that's um, weekend after next, in Portland, Oregon, um, and this is a, a full weekend. This is. Um, Basically, you, you spend the weekend there. The, you sp you, the Saturday is a um, an unconference, so you, you you get together and talk about things and to have to have the conversations about different aspects of, of, of building your own website. And then the the Sunday is a building day where you get together and implement some of the things you've talked about or improve your site and so on. And that's um, that's coming up. Oh, and then there's a there's a there's a drinks on the Friday night. So that's coming up June the twenty fourth, twenty fifth, in Portland. And there's 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 still nine or ten places left, um, and it's going to be live streamed as well. Nice, cool. And, the, and that should be if they want to check on that. Is that that's the indieweb.org or 2017.indieweb.org? Yes, um, awesome. indieweb.org is the uh, the main site. 2017.indieweb.org is the summit. Awesome. There we go. So check that out if you're in the area. Great stuff. Uh, Ron, I recognize yours, but there was some news yeah. associated with this yesterday, I think. Yeah, exactly. Some news broke a couple of weeks ago on All About Android. I brought to our app arena uh, a new email client called Astro, uh, which is available for both the uh, desktop as well as mobile. 
And if folks who have seen me on, on on this show or on all about Android know that I'm obsessed with the finding the perfect email client. And I don't know if Astro <laughs> is the perfect email client, but I'm really enjoying it. It's got um, an AI chatbot kind of tied into it. That's what that's their big kind of thing that they were promoting. The fact that you could like talk to this bot about your email and be like, who is Jason? And when did he write to me? And things like that. Um, I don't necessarily use that, but uh, it works with Gmail and with Office 360. And I believe that they're adding other support for other email services. Services. It's just a really well-designed, slick uh, email application. But uh, they were in the news, I think, yesterday or the day before with the announcement that they've added integration with uh, Amazon Echo and Alexa so you can uh, interact with your email via your Echo. Uh, and I hope Google Home is coming soon because that's what I have. Uh, but then they also added a Slack integration so you can actually uh, interact with your email via Astro in Slack, which I find very funny because Slack is meant to be the anti-email so bringing email into Slack is a bit of a, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. But still, sometimes uh, you got to do it. Sometimes. sometimes you got to do it. But it's a really, really well done integration and it's really uh, sleek and elegant. So if you're a Slack user and you're looking for an email client that integrates Slack, Astro is the way to go. All in all, it's great. I'm moving into it to, to it for my desktop as well as uh, my Android phone. Uh, so I recommend it. It's at uh, helloastro.com. You can check it out there. And do you integrate or do you... Um I don't know because you can chat with the 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 AI bot from within yep. the app. Do you do you interface like that at all? No, I don't. I'm I, I'm I'm an adult. <laughs> Fair I just, enough. I just. I just I just need my email, but no, no, I, I actually haven't played with the chatbot that much. Maybe I will a little more. I still need to load it in. Like currently, I've only got I, I have like eight email accounts now that I'm are actively going. And so yeah. I need a client that can do all eight of them. And that takes a while to load them and organize and everything. So that's my weekend plan is that I'm switching completely over after this weekend, especially like I was, I was testing it. I was playing with it with one email account and it's passed the smoke test. And now that they have the Slack integration, I'm like, oh, I'm all in. So nice. awesome. All right. That's Astro. Hello, Astro.com. Uh, mine is just here to freak you out. It's uh, mm. it's pics to pics photo generator. This has been making the rounds the last couple of weeks. It's with an F, photogenerator.mpocloud.nl. This is one of those tools where on the left you have your input. I wish I could do it on my touch screen on my Pixel, but it doesn't allow me to do it. But you can use your mouse. Essentially, what you do is you you can clear that image and you can create a little st a, a face. So I don't know. You could do something very rudimentary. Uh, or you can get really detailed. Some people, I think, are are able to, you know, use a, a Wacom kind of interface. I bet it would work really well on a Surface or whatever. And then you hit process, and it takes it takes a machine, <laughs> an AI algorithm on the back end that's been trained with human faces to take the face that you draw and. And it basically turned it into a human life form. It is the creepiest thing you'll ever see. And the, the more detailed you get with some of these pictures, the weirder results you get. I put a link to a uh, an article in the doc underneath this with just some examples of uh, of things that you know that artists have done and non artists. And no matter how you how you do it, there's just a lot of really weird outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> you, Jason, you love these kind of things. I, like, this is like, like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it, and I don't know why. I, what I really love about this is I love the idea of taking what it was like a stick figure. Like, look at that. That looks like a, a beast or something. I love it. Um, yeah, it looks it looks like Guillermo del Toro type monsters. Totally, right? like, totally. Yeah, yeah. It's right. very, it's very much the uh, what, what was the Google the Deep Dream stuff yeah. where you know. The, Suddenly, you know, you you feed it a picture, and suddenly there are eyeballs everywhere. But it's basically it's doing this conversion from stick figure art, or you know, or just trace trace art of a face, and it actually turns it into a human. What would the human look like? And you can you can poke around and and see some examples of what this thing has done. I mean, look at that. That's really cool. Yeah. Like that stick figure, you know, that that line uh, tracing turned into an actual face with shading and. I've just seen some really crazy results and it's just a, I, I wish I could come up with something half as awesome in my attempts to do this stuff. Uh, mine don't like that dog. That looks really great. I don't know. It's a, it's a cool thing to scare yourself with, I guess.
Horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. Horrifying, yes, <laughs> but fun at the same time. Uh, look for Picks to Picks Photo Generator, and you can play around with it and uh, see see what kind of horrifying art you come up with. Uh, it's a, just an interesting example of what AI is doing in this day and age, and we're at the we're at the beginning of it all. It seems. Uh, I think I think we did it. I think we made it. We we channeled through the Google. We we dug ourselves through the Android, and then we took a dip into the Facebook and Amazon waters a little bit as well. And it was a lot of fun because I had both you guys on. First, Kevin Marks, KevinMarks.com. It's always fun to get this, the chance to do this with you, Kevin. Thank you so much for uh, staying up late with us. Uh oh, I think your connection just just uh, just went out. I'll say bye to Ron and I'll come back to you because I think I think it froze for a second. Uh, okay. Ron, we yes. podcast a lot, but it's never enough. Thank you for coming on to the This Week in Google today. My pleasure. Yeah, no, it was great. Great to be here to talk about more than just Android, talk about Google, Facebook, all that fun stuff. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And folks can find me, uh, follow me on Twitter at RonXO. And that's where I talk about all my other projects and other stuff. Check out my other podcasts, uh, talking about comic books over at ifanboy.com and talking about Twin Peaks with Tom Merritt at uh, damnfinepodcast.com. Radical. And uh, I mean, you're like deep in the current season of Twin Peaks, right? At this point? Yes, we are. We are one third of the way through the new season of Twin Peaks, Twin Peaks, the return on Showtime. And uh, we put out new episodes every Sunday night, Monday morning, right after right after we watch it, we record and we do our immediate impressions. And it's been a lot of fun. And it's uh, we got, I think, oh, geez, 12 more episodes to go. So so all through the summer, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> All right. Right on. You're doing a great job with that. And I'm sorry I missed you last night, but we'll be back there yeah, next we'll, week. We next got, week. We got yes. next week. Yeah, Always of course. Fun. Everyone, everyone check out All About Android uh, every Tuesday at 530 Pacific time here on Twit. <laughs> That's right. I'm stalling, of course, also because I'm hoping to get, uh, get, get Kevin back. But I think Kevin might be lost to the wolves. I think, I think what happened is Kevin saw my pick and couldn't and help himself. Scared. And he got scared. Yeah. He ran away. <laughs> I'm assuming if we get him back, we'll, we'll say a proper goodbye, but uh, I always enjoy uh, podcasting with Kevin. It's great to have him on kevinmarks.com If you want to find out about all that he's up to in the open web, which is very close to his heart uh, yes. as you've heard on this show before. So uh, a big thanks to Kevin for taking time out of his night to join us. And as for me, I'm Jason Howell. You can find me all over the Twit network. Of course I do tech news today uh, every day with Megan Maroney, do all about Android with Ron and a whole lot of other things on the network and a Occasionally fill in here on This Week in Google. Uh, reminder that Twig records every Wednesday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Uh, you can join live, of course, twit.tv slash live. You can follow along live. We had some uh, folks in studio watching for a while. That was a lot of fun. Uh, but you can do it virtually just by going there. Uh, and, of course, you can find the show on demand at twit.tv slash twig, T-W-I-G. And big thanks to John. Big thanks to... Carson as well for helping out uh, here in the studio and getting everything all coordinated with the show because I always have a lot of fun doing it. So thanks for having me back. I think I th Leo's back next week, right? Yes. Getting two big uh, nods on that. So welcome back, Leo, next week on This Week in Google. We'll see you then. Bye, you guys.